Oh man, we're live. Miss Polin, you ready to do this? Yes, I am good to Let's go. Do it. It's time for another episode of the Daily K Podcast on KTTV.com with your host, Kendrick Thomas. Bridging the gap between the school and community. community. Here's KT. What it do, KTTV? This is KT, and I'm coming at you live with another episode of the Daily K Podcast. And on today's episode, I have author, mm-hmm. editor, awesome woman, and so much more, Miss Katara Polin. How are you doing today, Miss Polin? I'm doing well. How are you? Look, I am fine. It is spring break down here in Texas, and um, I've been relaxing this week, so yeah. I'm feeling good. But I, <laughs> hey, I know you are not on break, so uh, thank you for taking some time out the grind to uh, come and talk to us tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, before we jump into things, I always like to do a wellness check. We know it's been crazy out here. Um, so how have you been uh, throughout this pandemic, and how are you staying safe? Yes, um, I've been doing well during the pandemic. Um, staying safe. I still wear my mask, even though at least here in New York, we don't have the mandate anymore. So I always wear a mask when I go out. Um, I recently bought a home. So, you know, spending time furnishing my house and um, taking care of that has uh, kept me occupied. <laughs> Man, I can bet. Um, so mm-hmm. wait a minute. What part of New York again? Rochester, New York. OK. And so now without the mandates, um, are you still having to show like the card? I have I've never been asked to show my card here in Rochester. Uh-huh. So okay. um, I yeah. yeah, I don't think they implemented that component. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just had the uh the craziest run in with that. I was um preparing for to help a friend move into a, a convention that mm-hmm. was going and she was like, I need your vaccination card. And so I, I got the card and I mean it looks like it's been through some things. Like right. I, one of my elementary kids cards. <laughs> And so I tried to send it to her. It was crazy. Our state doesn't do the uh, online card. So it was a whole scenario. But now I know it's just us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so jumping into tonight, uh, you know, just thinking about writing that first book, being that author. Uh, as an entrepreneur, it's like I grow my business every time I have to learn a new skill to grow right. my business. Uh, so giving us, give us a little bit of background on how you became an editor and uh, in the role you are now. Yes. So I've always loved reading and writing. I started writing poetry in middle school. So uh, moving into editing was natural. I have a friend who's also a publisher and she was looking for an editor. So I did a sample edit for her um, and she really um, appreciated the insight and the feedback and the recommendations. So she started referring me to her publishing clients. So I had a steady stream of income that way. And a uh, few, you know, clients coming in. So I decided to go ahead and launch Love for Words in 2017. Um, I was already making money from it. I had a passion for it and it didn't make sense not to, you know, create a, you know, an official and viable stream of income so that I could run my own business um, and make, you know, my own money. So um, that's really what motivated me to start the business and then why I, you know, continued in the business is I primarily work with other black female entrepreneurs here in the U.S. ages 30 to 60. Mm -hmm. So being a black woman, I'm always honored to work with my clients and see, you know, them become published authors. And when I get to attend their book signings, that's always a beautiful thing. And encouraging them to tell their stories, making sure that our stories are told the way they should be with respect and value and love and appreciation. Um, And one of the things, you know, being an author myself, I realize is there is a veil when a black woman hands her manuscript to a white editor. Mm -hmm. So I want to be a part of closing that gap because, you know, with that, that racial veil there, there comes judgment. So not only is that editor critiquing your manuscript in a way they're critiquing you, because you're using names like Katyra instead of Catherine, or you're talking about, you know, a culture that's considered inferior, so to speak. So as a Black editor working with Black authors, it's very important for me to um, to be able to relate to the authors and not judge them because I'm familiar with the culture and I have a love and appreciation for it. So I really love being able to bring our stories to light mm-hmm. and you know, make sure that my clients are comfortable coming to me and not feeling um, that they are not going to be, you know, serviced the way they need to. 
And I think about, uh, you know, like you say, just bringing that story to light. Um, so many people have that story inside of them, but then it's the access to that information. Um, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, and I think about this lady. Um, and, and like I said, I, I can't remember her name. It was like Sybil Fox or something. But she, uh, do you know what I'm talking about, the story from Amazon? No. Okay, so they were robbing banks in my hometown, mm -hmm. but she was able to chronicleize, like, and never thinking that she would do something with it. But but um, eventually she published that story. Amazon paid her, I want to say, almost a million dollars or something, mm -hmm. right? So as you go through your work of editing and pulling out more of the story from people, um, what are you seeing as that main reason that people never choose to even tell the story? Um, when it comes to telling personal stories like memoirs and autobiographies, mm -hmm. it's usually because um, the client is worried about those who it will impact. Mm -hmm. So they might be writing stories that involve, you know, people who have done harm to them mm -hmm. or have done illegal or immoral things. So obviously that comes with a, a level of maybe apprehension, because if that person reads your book and sees that you have you know, elements of their lives in there, they might be upset. Whether it's true or not, um, that that is usually a roadblock for people who are writing stories about their own lives. I focus on nonfiction. So the majority of the authors I work with are either writing poetry, memoirs, autobiography, self-help. Um, all of them are are focusing on their own personal stories. So there's, again, there's the apprehension of, is this going to piss somebody off? Um, am I going to hurt somebody by telling my story, which of course includes other people? So I've seen that a few times. Um, luckily though, most of the clients who come to me are ready to take that risk. So I haven't really, you know, had a lot of clients there, but I've seen it a few times. Mm, seen it a few times. Yeah. Um, let's go through the, uh, what Sheila says. Hello, my hey, Sheila. Um, hey. She say, uh, telling your story is healing for others. And uh, what she say, what people would say or how they would feel. I guess that was in response to um, uh, really being apprehensive about writing. Yeah. Uh, so now, saying you've been there before, you, you think about nonfiction is really, Man, that mindset, that mind state is really awesome to be able to develop that. How do you go about um, meeting someone who wants to pull that nonfiction out that doesn't have that courage to say, I'll share my story? Yeah, so one of well, the first step, um, if you're interested in working with me, is the consultation form. So on that form, you'll answer questions about your book. Um, why are you writing it? What motivated you to write it? Who are you writing it for or who's your target market? So those are the questions that I ask everyone I work with. So if you're not able to answer those questions, then it will be challenging for you to move forward. So anyone who comes to me who's still, I'm not sure about it. Those are the types of questions that we talk about to make sure that you, you know, have a solid idea of why you're writing it and who it's for. Because if you don't, you know, the book is not going to market well, it's not going to resonate or resonate, excuse me, and it's not going to, um, you know, meet the goals that you're looking to achieve. So it's really about deciding why you're writing it and who you want to help or what your goal is with your book. Um, you know, who who do you think your ideal reader is? What do you want them to walk away with when they finish your book? How do you want them to feel? Um, those are very important questions that you will you will need to have the answer to before you can publish your book or write your book. Man, so then just thinking about um, going back to the beginning, right? Um, man, I just I'm still intimidated by writing by, for myself or about myself. So I, I agree with that part. Uh, but I do have some friends who have created those fiction pieces. Um, when you're thinking about going back to you now, eight times. Eight times published author, so it, I know it's been a minute. <laughs> but but just going back to that first book experience, uh, and and people say, man, if I knew what I knew now, but now is the time to share it with somebody. What were some of those misconceptions uh, and challenges that you had to overcome to put out that first book that you do um, different now? Yeah, um, I would say one of the things that I would have done is focus more on marketing the book. Mm. So I'm um, writing it wasn't too much of an issue. 
Um, I actually worked backwards when I wrote my book. I wrote out the list of the chapters and then I filled in the content. That's that's seem, That was easier for me. Um, and that's what I recommend to those who might be stuck in writing their book. It's so much easier uh, once you already have your topics or your chapters to go and do your research and fill it in instead of trying to think of the content without having those chapters or labels or sections. Um, so actually writing it was fine. Um, my first book is Professionalism, What's That? And it covers the important things we need to know in the workforce, either as employees or employers. So I talk about conflict management, how to dress for success, resume cover letters. Um, and I also talk about code switching. Um, so with that book, you know, I did a lot of research on what professionalism is and, you know, finding definitions and, you know, talking about the different impact of how you behave at work, you know, wh what, how that influences, you know, whether you're promoted or how you're perceived and things like that. And um, so that part was easy, but I didn't do I really didn't market it. You know, I told my family and friends I was publishing it, but I didn't take advantage of like speaking engagements. Once you write a book, that's a, you know, that's an open door to speaking engagements. That's an open door to creating online courses or creating programs or curriculum based on your book, depending on what your book is about. So there are so many ways that you can monetize your book that I didn't take advantage of, you know, the first time around. But of course, with experience, um, I was able to do those things. Like even with my first book, I was able to get it into the library. That didn't happen until a few years later because, you know, I didn't have the knowledge of, yeah. you know, marketing practices. Um, but, you know, I was able to do that. And then I also encourage like uh, virtual book tours. So you can create your own virtual book tours. You can hire an author uh, public relations specialist who takes care of all of that. They will book you on podcasts and book you on panels and, um, you know, get you connected to different opportunities, you know, radio interviews and, you know, pretty much any type of media opportunities that that public relations specialist um, can help you. I would just recommend making sure that who, whatever PR specialist you connect with specializes in um, self-published books because it's different than you know getting somebody on the radio who's a musician. There are different elements to that. But that's the one piece that was missing from my first book was that uh, marketing and taking advantage of all the opportunities that come from writing a book. And you can even create products based on your book. Um, there are people who sell t-shirts based on their book characters, pencils, pens, book bags, mugs. So it, it's not limited to like digital products. You can create physical products. So I wish that's something that I had known when I published my first book, but I'm so glad that I learned along the way. Yeah. So now going from the first book, number one, professionalism, what was number eight about? Um, the last book... Actually, the last one that I was publishing was an anthology. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Colorism Healing. Mm -hmm. So the poems and the short stories and entries were about colorism um, from different perspectives. So one of my, my, the poem that I entered is called Mocha Chocolate. And really it uh, empowers and uplifts dark skinned girls and women. Um, because as I'm sure you know, um, there is, you know, colorism exists across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, and dark skin is, is typically considered um, less attractive, not as beautiful, not as desired, um, and things like that. So the colorism healing, her name's Dr. Sarah Webb, um, that anthology was really an opportunity to acknowledge that it exists and work to combat it and acknowledge that it's wrong and that um, we have the power to change that and reverse the centuries of you know, colorism that came that, you know, Eurocentric ideas of, of colorism and what's considered beautiful and better and things like that. So that was the last um, publication that I was a part of. And that was um, a healing experience for me yeah. and for those who were involved. So um, that worked out really well. And just for example, I was also a part of a conference based on the anthology. So again, books can really open the door to so many different opportunities. Man, it seems like in your writing uh, for your personal, um, like you say, it is a lot of that real life, like nonfiction. This is what it is. Right. But, so how do you bridge that gap going between this real life, but being so comfortable to um, make fiction almost your lane? So I actually specialize in nonfiction. Okay. Um, so I, I don't really go between the worlds. Every yeah. once in a while, I might edit like a novel. 
Yeah. But I would say 98% of the books that I write or anthologies that I'm involved in or books that I edit are nonfiction. Mm. So I'm, you know, pretty level when it comes to that. I don't yeah. do too much transition between the two. That's cool, man. That's cool. And and not to be confused with the proofreader. Let that be known, people. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. And so um, I, I guess one thing about that is uh, being able to connect all of this information um, to just simply having the resources. Like, this is why I was so excited about doing this show, because mm -hmm. I know so many people who do have that story, but are stuck or are sometimes, you know, paralyzed by their fear. Um, so now knowing that that's a big uh, determining fact in our community, mm -hmm. are you a one-stop shop uh, as far as the website to get those resources or where else can we find uh, free resources to kind of get us along? Yes. So um, Love for Words specializes in editing. However, um, we do have a vast, nest, vast network of literary professionals. So if you become a client, but you don't have a publisher, I can connect you with a publisher. Or if you're looking for an illustrator, I can connect you with an illustrator, a formatter. Um, if you want to do audiobooks, I have um, someone on my team who specializes in narrating audiobooks. So we focus on editing, but we're able to plug you into the other um, professionals and channels that you might need to publish your book. So you can come and ask us for our recommendations um, if you're looking for services outside of what we handle. So we certainly, you know, um, we certainly have a referral network um, and we're able to assist you. Um, for those of you who are starting up on your own and you, you know, maybe want to look for your own and not get a referral, um, you can visit uh, Fiverr.com. Uh, that's two R's on Fiverr. Um, basically, it's a database of freelance professionals. So you could find an editor there. You could find an illustrator, a formatter. Um, you can find someone to transcribe. You can find just about any type of um, service that you need to write your book, you can find on Fiverr. So mm -hmm. I recommend Fiverr. And again, that's with two R's. Um, that's one place you can start. Um, LinkedIn has a very large um, database as well. So mm -hmm. if you're you know, looking for a professional, you can go on LinkedIn and take a look. There's plenty of groups on Facebook. So that's another avenue for you. So there are plenty of resources where you can find uh, the people who will become the team who helps you publish your book. Yeah, that is. I see Miss Gaston. Um, hello, is this your area of expertise? Not mine, but it is Miss Poland's. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm on to write my first book based on the recent events. Uh, yes, we are recording this, so we'll be uh you'll be able to go back and look at it. Um, so I also drop Miss Poland's information down there so you can get started on that book. Mm -hmm. Man, that's awesome. So one of the biggest um Challenges, like you said, were just the marketing, but but also dealing with the colorism. So is it hard to really break? Was it hard to break your books inside of New York City? Like, and I'll say that because if you think about the music, right? And everybody's like, man, I can sell a million before mm -hmm. I even leave the city. Mm -hmm. So was is it hard, like going through that struggle and, and self-publishing up there? So I live in Rochester, New York, which mm -hmm. is like six or seven hours from New York City. Okay. So we're not <laughs> we're not a part of that um, city. We're a little ways away. Yeah. However, um, with self publishing, I mean, um, like with anything where you're starting your own, there it comes with challenges, um, especially if you don't already have a following. Yeah. So one of the misconceptions is that once you've published a book, you will sell a lot of books and make a lot of money. Um, does that happen? Absolutely. Um, but typically, when you, if you self-publish or you publish a book um, and you're able to do that, that's because you already have a following. So when Oprah publishes a book, all of Oprah's fans or majority of them buy her book um, because she's Oprah. Um, versus, you know, Katyra, you know, there's people who buy my book, but those numbers don't look like Oprah's. Hey. So <laughs> I always, or not yet anyway, yeah, you um, I encourage authors, you know, to to be realistic about how many books you're going to sell and how much money you will make and not uh, publish just to make money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some authors who do, but in the self-publishing world, it's important to be realistic um, if yeah. you don't already have that following. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that answered the question. I think you were asking, oh, yeah. is it challenging to break into it? Yeah. Um, it comes with its challenges, but being self-published, you have to 
um, be very diligent. You have to be dedicated. You have to have a plan to get your you know book sold. You need a team who's going to help you get there. Make sure you set a goal, and you will have to work hard to meet your goal. So, um, if you're not interested in working hard, then being a self-published author might not be the route for you. <laughs> mm. and, and once I do put it out, should I go or should I do both? Should I go my website or should I go Amazon? You can do both. I actually okay. do both. So mm -hmm. sometimes I get orders through my website um, and then other times people buy it through Amazon. So I would recommend both. Um, I know there are a lot of people who, you know, don't shop on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be some people who will prefer to buy the book directly from you. Yeah. And the other con with Amazon is they do take a cut of the royalty. So um, you just have to, you know, weigh the pros and cons and decide, um, you know, how much of that royalty you want to share with Amazon or if you want to go another route and, you know, hold on to more of your earnings. Mm, that's it. Look, look, hold on. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go through some comments here. Uh, Denise said, uh, please text the information you're sharing to the audience. Like I say, I'll make sure to put uh, your information down. Um, are okay. you on LinkedIn? Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay, so I'll definitely yes. uh, tag you um, okay. with this video. Perfect. Uh, so then, uh, let's see. As Katie says, thank you so much for giving your time. Uh, this welcome. information is so, so valuable. Thanks uh, for most definitely, us, Most definitely agreed. Uh, like I said, I was excited about this because whether you're already going or you really you're trying to get it out, everybody needs that information because it's, um, it's a big thing. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing. Yeah. So now another piece of that writing and your services is the copy. Yes. Right? And so uh, for entrepreneurs, my God, this is so important. So for those that don't know what I mean by copy, uh, can you just give us a little bit of explanation of it and how it's used uh, for professionals? Yeah. So the copy is is literally the text that you're using. So there's copy for your website, um, which you know, the copy for your website should be exciting. It should explain who you are um, and the services or products that you offer. Um, so basically anything that's written regarding you and your business is considered the copy. Um, so when you, if you have a social media page, if you have a manager, then your social media manager creates your social media copy, which mm -hmm. is the caption that goes along with whatever images or videos that you're sharing. Yeah. Um, and as you shared, um, the copy is very important. Um, making sure, again, that it's interesting. Are you boring your readers with what you're saying? Um, does it make sense? Are you being clear? Does it resonate with your target market? I mean, if you're marketing to, you know, youth in high school, there's certain language that you should be using. Um, you might not want to use language that was popular some decades ago before they were alive um, because you're going to lose your audience. Um, so copy is extremely important. Um, and then I actually just recently did a web, uh, excuse me, a webinar where I talked about uh, writing about yourself and your business. Mm -hmm. So when you write your, you know, your author bio or your entrepreneur bio, are you using words that, um, describe who you are and what you do. So like in my bio, I say I'm a nine time published author instead of I'm an author. Which one of those sounds better? Which one of those is going to draw in your um, whoever's reading it, really? Um, so instead of just saying you are a speaker um, in my bio, I say I'm a statewide speaker. So when you're writing about your business and yourself, uh, make sure you're using adjectives and you're describing because you don't want to lose your readers. Um, if you, if you, I mean, just make sure you're explaining yourself well. If if I don't say that I'm a nonfiction editor, I'm I might get a lot of fiction people coming yeah. to me, which kind of defeats the purpose. So the copy is is important. Make sure that it's clear, that mm -hmm. it makes sense, and that it draws people in. And you're not. Yeah. Um, make sure you're not doing yourself a disservice. You want to. Uh, shine your light and make sure people know all the great things that you do and what you have to offer. You make it sound so easy. <laughs> well, we know that it is. Oh, so hard. Let's see here. Let's get to some of these uh, last few comments. Um, okay. So what did Katie say? Okay. So she was talking about the information, okay. but like I said, we'll make sure we plug you all. And I think this was in response to the Oprah comment. She said, you could be larger than Oprah, drive your plan, create focus, build momentum. 
Mm-hmm. Don't play no games. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, Denise said oh, she will definitely reach out okay. uh, via LinkedIn. So awesome. Getting it going. Uh, you know, thinking about that copy, uh, big shout out to uh, one of my teachers from last year, Ms. Wasserman. Uh, so during the pandemic, she's at the house. She figures out copy. She gets the course. She gets the creator group. Mm-hmm. She builds it. She resigns from teaching and goes copy full time. So that tells me people really need this service. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess when is it the time? Because people will try to figure it out. They'll do so much. But when is it the time that I say I can't do this? I need to hire a professional. It, it really depends. So if you know that writing is not your strong suit, that's something you struggle with. That's something that takes you a lot of time. It's something that drains you. You might want to get a copywriter out the gate. Mm-hmm. You might want to get the copywriter to do the website for you, to do your social media for you, to write your bio for you. Um, if you enjoy writing, if you're good at it, if it's a strength of yours, you can do it and then just have somebody proofread it for you before it goes live. So it really just depends on your preference. It depends on uh, what strengths you have and, you know, your values. How much are you willing to invest yeah. um, either, well, money and time? Mm. Do you have time to write your copy? Um, if not, do you have the money to pay somebody to do it for you? Um, and then the other piece of that, too, that I think we forget is bartering. So even if you can't afford to pay the copywriter, what skills or strengths do you have that you can provide in exchange? So you might not be able to pay the copywriter a thousand dollars, but you're a photographer. So you can take, you know, you can do a brand photo shoot for the copywriter in exchange for them doing your web copy or writing your bio or handling your social media for a month or two. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on, you know, what resources you have available, uh, time and money and what you're willing to invest to get that copy done right. And you know, are there any copy checklists out there or, or some like a something to refer back to that you would recommend? I'm sure there are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any on the top of my head. But okay. Um, okay. If you, you know, you can Google copyright lists. Yes. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of videos on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, yeah, I can't think of any, but, yeah. you know, do your due diligence. I am sure there are plenty out there. So yeah. just check your resources, make sure it's, mm-hmm. you know, uh, um, 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 what's the word, a reputable person yeah. or a reputable business. And I'm sure those checklists will be helpful. Mm. Then at the end, they can always come back to love for words. Absolutely. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> love number four words.com. Hey. <laughs> love for words.com. <laughs> so the said, what if I'm trying to be a multifaceted author, entrepreneur, HR professional? Um, so how, how, how do you push the book out when you got so much going on like that? Um, So, yeah, actually, I'm working with a client now. So um, I'm much like yourself. You said that was Denise, right? Yes. Is that Denise? So much like yourself, Denise, I'm a speaker. I have a podcast. I'm an author. I'm an editor. So most of the clients have more than one hat and there's nothing wrong with it. So if you're looking to write a book and this book is about uh, maybe your marriage, then you want to write your author bio for that book with a focus on marriage, Mm -hmm. with a focus on your relationship. Um, If you write a book and you're talking about best business practices, then that's the time for you to write a bio that talks to what you have in that book. Mm -hmm. So really, you're going to change the lens based on what you're doing. If you're going on a book tour for your book about marriage, You'll want to connect with podcasters who talk about relationships, romantic relationships, the do's and don'ts, et cetera. But if you have a book, again, about um, best business practices, you may want to connect with, you know, the the Daily K podcast to talk about your business (laughs) Um, or another business oriented podcast so that you can highlight that book. So uh, as people, we are multifaceted. Um, and I encourage you to be great and glorious in all the, the talents and hats that you wear. Just make sure that you separate those um, because you don't want to have a reputation of um, doing doing it all. Um, even if you can, you should have some type of niche, even if it's by time. So maybe this year you're focusing on your business. And then in 2023, you decide, you know, I want to pivot and I want to focus on talking about 
having a healthy marriage. So then next year you will move into that element and everything that you're doing will focus on that. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, you don't have to get rid of those hats, but you do have to organize and make sure that you have a plan of when to highlight one of those hats and then put the other one on the back burner. So mm -hmm. that's it. That was powerful. I, I really want to say, did you have any final thoughts as we close this out? But it seemed like you, <laughs> Just drop the knowledge right there. Man, just be organized. That's it. Okay, so um, I, I want to say thank you for uh, taking some time out tonight to really come through, drop so much valuable information on us, uh, Ms. Poland. Um, tell us, please, how do we find you? How do we get in contact with you for all the services? Absolutely. So you can visit my website. Uh, that's love with the number four words. So loveforwords.com. Um, you can send me a message there. If you're interested in editing um, and you're ready for that stage, you can fill out the consultation on my website, loveforwords.com. Um, if you have questions about the editing process, um, copy for your website, copy for your bio. Again, as I shared, I did a webinar on that. So I'm happy to connect with you there. Um, so you can schedule a consultation um, to have a free phone call with me as well, a networking call. So um, that's another way. I am on Instagram at Poland LLC, also Twitter at Poland LLC. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Katyra Poland on LinkedIn. So you can search me there and connect there. I am more than happy to um, support you and encourage you. And of course, um, have you come on board as a client. So uh, please do follow me. Please do email me and reach out. I would love to connect with you about editing and the other services and see that you're successful in your journey. Man, that will do it. Well, once again, thank you uh, for that time. And I look forward to sharing this so more people can get on board. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's been a pleasure. Thank oh, you, everyone, man. for attending. All right. All right, y'all. This is KT for KTTV signing out. 100. This is Darnell Broadcast Houston. This is Dr. Tamara Beckford. Hey, this is Candace. This is London Underwood. This is Kirsten Bass with Inner City Greens, and you're watching. Y'all are now tuned in to KTTV. 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 KTTV.